Welcome everyone. Uh, this is San Francisco Big Analytics. Uh, my name is Chester Chen. So we have this event mostly uh, monthly and sometimes uh, twice a month, depends on the topic. And uh, so today we have uh, and Jay, Lee, uh, Jay Liu from the, uh, well, you know, I'll introduce it just a second. I'm talking about the deep learning based uh, recommender systems, how to scale them. Uh, before I do that, I want to first thank our uh, partners, uh, AI Camp who you know, always provide the, the, the Zoom for us. So, so we have this uh, free Zoom you know, for the community. So uh, today we have a very special topic and uh, you know, you know, Lee is, uh, Jay, Jay Lee is uh, our special guest. Um, Dr. Jay Lee, Jay Liu uh, from the uh, computer science, PhD computer science has uh, worked as a student professor as in academic. And then he joined the like several Chinese uh, technology company, including Tencent. Recently, he's the head of the AI lab for uh, second largest uh, short video company uh, in China called Quaiso, and uh, they have a, a U.S. branch in Seattle. He's the head of it, and of course, they have a coming a lot of amazing technologies with the recent development. We're lucky to have him in January give a talk, uh, talk about uh, how they you know how they are doing a distributed machine learning system. So you probably want to uh, see that recording, uh, see, see that the papers I posted. Uh, so today he's talking about how to scale the you know, deep learning based recommender systems with uh, 100 trillion parameters. Without further ado, you know, Dr. Lee, please. Okay, thanks for your introduction and the organization. It's my second time to share our recent work uh, here. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, yeah, the training engine for recommendation system. Uh, <clears throat> the main target is to how to scale up the training to yeah, uh, hundreds of training parameters. And the first question you may ask, okay, why recommendation is so important, uh, especially for this uh, to be companies and to be apples applications. <clears throat> so if we look at the revenue formula, and the revenue formula for most of uh, <clears throat> IT companies is equal to the user engagement times user consumption. So user engagement means how long the user stay there on your app. And the user consumption means uh, how much money he spend uh, when he engaged in your app. So these two items, the application, yeah, gives your revenue. Okay. <clears throat> so how to increase the engagement? Uh, the most important thing is recom the right items, right uh, contents to the users to make the user stay longer in the app and you to increase the user consumptions the most important way is to recommend ads to the users so the question is how to recommend the, the most appropriate ad, uh, <clears throat> product to the user so no matter to increase the engagement or consumption yeah both of them refers to how to do a good recommendation yeah how to make the uh, <clears throat> perfect uh, or appropriate uh, uh, linkage between the users and items. Items could be content, could be video articles, could be ads, whatever. Yeah, so that's why we can see the business model for most of IT companies like Facebook, Google, Instagram, Amazon. Yeah, all of them using <clears throat> this yeah logic to get revenue. So that's why recommendation is so important. Another <clears throat> truth uh, to witness the uh, recommendation is uh, developing so fast uh, is by the model size. Yeah. <clears throat> In 2016, uh, the YouTube uh, issued the uh, uh, model size is uh, just uh, one billion parameters. And uh, we can see the model size getting larger and larger, larger and larger. Yeah, and here very recently, uh, the model size issued by Facebook has reached uh, yeah, 10 training parameters, okay? So based on this uh, figure, we can see the model size increase 
uh, in the exponential rate. Uh, so that's very, that's very huge. And there's a fundamental reason why we need a, such a huge model is uh, shown on the right hand side of this PPT. <clears throat> we can see the data is increasing crazily every day. And uh, uh, to fit such large data, we need a large model, okay? Because the fundamental uh, reason, the fundamental logic for deep learning or any model-based or data uh, or data-driven approach is, is nothing but using parameters to memorize the data. So the data becomes larger, the model should become larger as well. So, <clears throat> so that's why the model can enlarge. When the model gets large, the prediction is more accurate. That um, helps the company to get more money and uh, <clears throat> get you have more the company has more money can yeah read to to improve the uh, the product and uh, make the users stay longer and have more users right, such that the data becomes larger and larger. So we can see this loop runs. Uh, uh, forever, and we can see that's why the model, the the, the uh, different model, becomes larger and larger. Okay. So since the model getting is is increasing crazily in exponential rate, the challenge is to recover the system system infrastructure is how to yeah uh, accommodate to the ever growing the recommendation models. Yeah. <clears throat> Basically, we have three challenges one is from training and another is training is from inference yeah the third is serving so today i mean we mainly focus on the training part okay. so how to design a scalable training engine to meet the ever-growing model size Yeah, so before I go to very deep, I would love to give a brief review for the recommendation model evolu evolution. Uh, yeah, about uh, 10, 20 years ago, actually, the most popular uh, recommendation model is like design tree or naive logistic regression. Yeah, nowadays the design tree is kind of out of date. Nobody want to use it. Uh, anymore because it's hard to maintain, it's hard to do warm star, and it's not uh, uh, suitable for the uh, big data era. <clears throat> so we may focus on the uh, logistic regression part. Yeah, the naive logistic regression, the basic idea is just to use a, a vector or embedding vector to represent uh, each user and use the vector to uh, represent each a item, okay, and then use the inner product of these two vectors to indicate the relevance of this user and this particular item. So that's the basic idea of live logistic regression. <clears throat> okay, the uh, logistic regression received a lot of success, of course, in the early stage of the competition system, uh, but people find, okay, to pursue high performance, um, accuracy, and we need to make the model more complicated, more, more complicated. So it comes to complex logistic regression. We have more features for users and uh, uh, items and using embedding to encode the uh, user, fe user features and item features. And uh, also we have some cross features. So that makes the embedding part, the embedding vectors is very huge. Okay, so that is the second stage for uh, logistic regression. Now, <clears throat> in recent uh, probably three or four years, uh, yeah, people start to make the model even more complicated. The complication is coming from by replacing the inner product, yeah, which is essentially a linear uh, operator by the deep neural network, which is a nonlinear operator. Yeah, so if, if we take a look at the, yeah, my, take, take, <clears throat> take a look at it from the mathematical view and that be more clear, the naive logic regression is, uh, yeah, shown over here, the, the essential mathematical equation. 
and the linear combination of two vectors. And the complex the Lagrangian regression will add more features. Okay, for example, the gender features, the age features, and the, the race features, something like that. <clears throat> and also, yeah, we we'll include uh, the cross ID features. For example, the gender by the country, something like that. Yeah, we have multi, many uh, cross ID features. Yeah, the cross ID features actually will dominant number of features is because the combination is uh, increasing uh, in exponential rate. So this is for yeah complex logic regression model. Um, for deep learning model, actually the key difference, the key improvement is from the linear operator over here to nonlinear, replace the linear operator by a complicated, uh, yeah, deep neural network. So that is a key difference, and that is a key challenge uh, for us. Okay. So for the traditional logic regression model, that is a very basic one. Uh, people design the, uh, the, the state of art uh, training engine is, uh, people may, yeah, may have different names in different companies, but uh, I just pick up one of them, uh, which, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's called the MU, yeah. This architecture use uh, uh, homogeneous uh, design, um, <clears throat> make uh, multiple CPU machines, yeah, to connect to each other and uh, to join the training, uh, Deep learning uh, to train the logic regression model. Uh, this one is using uh, asynchronous update. Uh, it works, uh, yeah, I think it was great for a uh, small model, um, but <clears throat> the main um, issue is the accuracy may drops because using asynchronous update, especially when the number of machines is large. Yeah, when it comes to the uh, deep learning era, actually, uh, people find that the traditional architecture, yeah, using the GPU is not uh, good, <coughs> is not uh, efficient enough. So GPU is, yeah, involved as well, uh, was involved, involved as well. Um, but the, the design is basically just a natural extension from the uh, previous uh, generation. Yeah, you can see you, yeah, just upgrade the machine from CPU machine to uh, GPU machine, yeah, that's it. And using the GPU machine uh, to calculate the uh, new network part. So that is, uh, yeah, we call the MU plus. And this architecture is still very popular in most of, uh, yeah, top tier uh, IT companies. And the main uh, issue with this uh, idea is with this architecture is the cost, yeah, because uh, uh, this is a homogeneous system, uh, and then the GPU is mostly is not uh, full utilized. Yeah, so the CPU is uh, full utilized, but the GPU is not. So, uh, given this architecture, actually from the company's perspective, is not uh, economic. So <clears throat> people start to think, well, okay, can we have a better plan, a uh, better, better uh, architecture? Uh, about uh, three, yeah, I think three years, three or two years, and Baidu start to uh, develop some new architectures, which is called Airbox. So Airbox is trying to use the SSD to store the, uh, the embedding and parameters, yeah, which is because it's very huge, and integrate the CPU, GPU, and the SSD into a single machine. So that's called an AI box. Okay, so this is very really, this is the very latest solution. Um, it uses synchronous update, um, but the bottleneck is if we want to training a larger model, uh, one single machine is not, uh, uh, it's not uh, <coughs> uh, okay. We need the multiple machines. Yeah, we have multiple parallel structures like this. Yeah, if we scale to multiple machines, the airbox has a significant issue, which is have to uh, do the sparse communication. That is prone to be very 
uh, not very inefficient. Yeah, so the uh, scaling up is the main issue for Airbox. But it's a little solution for, uh, for uh, treating the uh, moderator size the deep learning model. Okay. okay, so last one is ours. Actually, we start to study how to design a flexible and uh, efficient uh, and accurate uh, uh, training engine for the new uh, uh, generation of deep learning models. Uh, this is our yeah, solution. Uh, we started this project about uh, three and a half years ago. Yeah. So this is a hybrid system and uh, using the heterogeneous system. And I will show the more details and the design logic later on. Yeah, but here is just roughly the uh, graph <coughs> showing some rough idea over here. Um, basically the GPU machines is kind of yeah, uh, homogeneous and the CPUs, GPUs, uh, CPUs are also uh, homogeneous, but be between CPU groups and the GPU groups, they are connected uh, using a uh, heterogeneous uh, architecture. Okay, so it means number of GPUs machines uh, can be different from CPU machines. Okay, and to design the training engine for the uh, new generation of deep learning, uh, deep recommendation models. Uh, is how to fully utilize the ever-growing updating hardware to meet the ever-growing models. I think that is the key because the hardware is developing every day and uh, the system, the training engine should evolve as well. Yeah, to show the details, uh, to show them uh, of Persia, the training engine developed by our team, uh, I would like to show some preliminary results, uh, some preliminaries for deep learning based models to have a better understanding. Um, so the first question actually uh, is, uh, what's the difference between deep learning, uh, the, the general deep learning model in computer vision and uh, uh, deep learning model in recommendation? Uh, actually, the key difference is the CV, in the CV, the deep learning model is mostly just a neural network. There's no embedding part, but in the recommendation scenario, the model parameters has two parts, the neural network part and the embedding part. The embedding parameter actually is very huge. So it's a storage is heavy, but the computation over uh, embedding is light. For the neural network parameters, <laughs> it's the storage is uh, light, but the computation is very heavy. So that is actually can, can, can be considered as a super set of training uh, uh, computer vision, the traditional computer vision model. Okay, so this is much more challenging. So directly using the existing plan doesn't work. Okay, based on this observation of embedding parameters and the neural network parameters, actually, it's a kind of implies the homogeneous system uh, shouldn't be the optimal solution. Yeah, and we need to design kind of a, a heterogeneous architecture to uh, fit these features. Okay. So far, any questions? You have so a, I had, go ahead. I had a simple question. Sure, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you you mentioned uh, moving from a decision tree and uh, logistic regression to deep neural network because of nonlinearity. But when we look at rectilinear unit and other simple unit, they're also piecewise linear. Um, so it's not really nonlinear in most deep neural network. It is similar to decision tree. Yes, decision tree is not a linear. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yes. No, no, but even deep learning with rectilinear unit or, uh, or similar variation 
is also not more than piecewise linear. It's just piecewise linear. Uh, what do you mean by piecewise linear? So, what, what, uh, the, yeah. The activation function is not a true nonlinear function. It just mm -hmm. has segments of linear. Oh, man. Okay. 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 Uh, Yes, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not linear, but when you have, even it's kind of piecewise linear, you have multiple layers, then it becomes the highly non-linear. And logistic regression does not have that. That's the main point you were trying to make. Uh, not sure when I say it's linear means the, 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 the inner product logistic is just a kind of uh, transformation from um, negative infinity to positive infinity to yeah uh, zero one that's what I mean so I I I I, 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 I yeah I, yeah so why I say it's linear means the inner part is is linear yeah you can see the mass for this is yeah uh, logistic uh, loss and this part is linear because it's just the inner product of these two vectors that's that's what I mean by that's linear. right yeah okay yeah thanks for clarification yeah sure thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anybody has uh, questions? Uh, since we only have a few people, so you can um Yeah, yeah, if there are any questions, yeah, stop me at any time point. Yeah, you can unmute yourself or post the, if you don't want to speak, uh, you can just post it on the chat. Thank you. You can continue with that. Okay, sure. Okay, so since you have two yeah, components in the uh, in deep uh, in in uh, recomp recomputation models, um, <clears throat> so next I will show the uh, basic uh, the training protocol. Okay. Yeah, to training uh, uh, deep learning based uh, recombinant models, the first step is to uh, feature. We call the feature collection. Yeah, fetch the features from uh, different uh, uh, embedded matrices. Okay, and to calculate a uh, long vector, which is the input of the new network. Yeah, followed by yeah forward computation, backward computation, and then probably some synchronization if the uh, new network leads to synchronization. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and followed by the uh, push back the embedding gradient to uh, update uh, the embedding parameters. So that is a single iteration. Okay, to understand how yeah our system works and the, the first uh, uh, question or first uh, uh, problem we should uh, solve is how to yeah place the parameters. That is the key, actually. That is the key for design every single uh, training engine. Okay. <clears throat> so we compared different uh, ideas, different possibilities, and this one is our final choice. Okay. For the embedding parameters, we because it's very very large the number uh, of parameters is very large, so there's no way to store in GPU. So it has to be stored in, uh, it could be stored in a uh, yeah, hard disk SSD, it could be stored in a uh, memory, but for the efficiency uh, purpose, it's better to save the, it's, yeah, store in the memory, okay. <clears throat> but even store in the memory, there are many different possibilities. Yeah, the way we use over here is to uh, split, uh, the divide each feature matrix into multiple component into multiple uh, segments and each se <clears throat> and the number of segments correspond to a number of CPU machines okay so this purpose is for to balance the computation and the storage node for each CPU machine for the GPU parameters and we uh, store, we have basically have multiple copies, okay? Each CGPU has a copy of new network parameter. So that is different from the way we store the uh, 
the invading parameters. Yeah, so we give a name over here for the CPU parameters we call the parameter server structure because this has a unique copy of uh, embedding parameters. But for the neural network parameters, we call the yeah, DP. DP means data parallel, yeah, which is analog as uh, uh, data parallel training okay, because I have multiple copies of N parameters. So this is how we place the parameters by comparing many different uh, uh, possibilities. Yeah, here I just uh, named some of them, some, some, uh, name a few uh, we, we have considered. Okay, so one other property is uh, mm, you, is we follow the same uh, way to store uh, uh, neural network parameters, just uh, split the neural network parameters into multiple GPUs. Yeah, that is uh, analog as a way to uh, embed in parameters. Yeah, the reason we didn't choose this plan is uh, uh, the first, uh, if we do the, we should have placed parameters in this way, uh, the communication cost for the neural network uh, parameter is identical as we, uh, as a data parallel architecture, but uh, the, if we use it this way, uh, there is no way to take benefit from mature communication toolkit such as uh, DDP, Hogwarts, or Bagua, developed by our MIT. Uh, so that's why we didn't use this way. Um, another <clears throat> possibility is, okay, we store all the parameters on CPUs and uh, only GPU take care of the computation. This other possibility. Yeah, <clears throat> we didn't use this one is we want to take benefits from uh, GPU to GPU connection. If we store the uh, new network parameters on GPU, we are able to use the fast uh, communication feature um, between GPU and GPU. Yeah. So these are two solutions. Actually, uh, this kind of idea has been uh, used in some um, very in some early uh, <coughs> training engines such like uh, uh, mu yeah or mu plus mm. uh yeah. One question over here yeah yeah there are two questions uh one is from tarney he said so what is the best way to store embeddings uh to it be like a user or items like a you know like in a key value stores or hdfs or traditional databases as a blob so it's, that's you know that's the first question Okay. I think this question is uh, kind of orthogonal to what I'm talking about here. Here I'm talking about uh, in the training phase, how to store the embeddings. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, Tandy's question is, uh, yeah, outside, yeah, outside of the training phase and uh, how to store the uh, embeddings. It, 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 yeah. Is my understanding correct? I think um, so. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Um, so in that case, actually, um, if uh, for the offline training and the uh, embedding is stored in HDFS, that's for sure. If it's a online training, yeah, and uh, the embedding will be node from the HDFS first to the memory, and we accept the, the online data from Kafka and to train in the model in the memory. So that is, yeah, two okay. different scenarios. Yeah, yeah, offline or online. Yeah. Good. And the second question coming from Eileen. Uh, Eileen, I run my Eileen. So I said, so what do you exactly mean when you say that each CPU holds a unique set of embedding parameters? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, here is the figure. Okay, so for example, here, the embedding matrix, okay, and each column is a, a representation for a user, okay? So we have many users and N here is number of CPU machines. We 
yeah, split uh, the this feature matrix into yeah multiple blocks, and uh, each CPU machine only save one block. So that is what I mean by. So that's why for uh, each CPU. When I say CPU here, sorry, I mean CPU memory. Okay, CPU memory. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's why for each machine, it has a unique set of embedding parameters. So in other words, uh, the embeddings are distributed among the memories on the different CPUs, right? Yes. And then after GPU. Uh, here, I can, sorry, I probably a little, a little abuse the, the term of CPU. Yeah, here we can to simplify the, the, the to simplify the uh, uh, to simplify the, the story. You can think uh, each only one machine only has one CPU. Yeah, here I mean CPU. You can yeah think as a machine. Yes. I see CPU yeah. machines. Okay. Yeah, CPU machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CPU machines. And, yes. And then on the on on the on the uh, GPU side, essentially, you take all the parameters and in a copy on yes, yes, exactly, yes, yeah. So for the G, yeah for the theoretical part, basically every single GPU, uh, uh, yeah, owns a copy of the parameter. Yes, and, the, and these GPUs are also means the GPU machines. Oh, uh, sorry, here GPU means single GPU, yeah. Single GPU, single GPU. Not, not a, yeah, single GPU. Maybe yeah. One, one machine may have multiple GPU. Yes, one okay. machine may have multiple GPU. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this basically means that you have different partitioning strategy for the lowest level parameters, and yes. for upper level parameter in the deep neural network. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's the key to design the whole training engine. Yeah. Because as I mentioned, uh, the fundamental reason is uh, the deep neural network. Uh, parameter is storage night computation heavy but the embedding parameter is is other way so that's why we need the different strategies to take care of both of them to optimize the efficiency and uh, many other things may i ask you when when we have data of different types like textual data video data and audio data maybe other graph data uh, whether this strategy uh, always separating embedding versus uh, neural network weights is the right strategy or sometimes, you know, depending on data type, you may have to draw the, the line differently. Could you, oh. could you describe for different data types? Is this idea still the same? Okay. I think uh, uh, the question you ask about uh, different data types, okay, how to Oh, uh, how to store them is more uh, is uh, is optimal way. Um, okay, I think that uh, there is no uh, uh, general answer, yeah, to your question. But a case, I think it should be case by case. For example, when you say a like text, uh, uh, yeah, the the the, the, the uh, a text data, and for that one, usually people view. Uh, first uh, to do some um, new migration and uh, uh, to vectorize the text data. That uh, is kind of different from scenario we discussed over here. Um, for example, you are training. For example, you're training a kind of a kind of a, a bird. Yeah, uh, are you trying to asking something like that? I'm not sure if I'm no, not, not like deep language model, but say word to back, right? That's a simple example of text embedding. And can oh, we work I, see, I, see, embedding, I see, right? I see, yeah. I see, more, I see. More like oh, that. I see. Okay, got it, got it. Something like graphic, some, 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 some graph learning, right? That like graph embedding stuff. Is, yeah. is that oh, okay, could okay, be graph, good, could good. be image, could be audio. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, very good question. Yeah, very good question. Yes, I think I'll follow the same principle. Yes, because we actually, uh, this training engine is also support uh, the uh, graph computing, uh, graph computing engine yeah, in, 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 yeah, in Queso, yes. Yes, because uh, if you take a look at the, uh, the underlying mathematical formulation, they are pretty much 
similar well, yeah uh, between the <laughs> graph embedding model and uh, and the uh, deep uh, uh, recommendation model yeah they pretty much mathematics is the same yeah and that's why they have very similar properties for embedding parameters and the uh, parameters yes okay thanks maybe we can revisit at the end of your talk i don't want to derail your talk thanks <laughs> no problem there, okay there's one more question sorry uh a very yeah. similar line on a similar line coming yeah. from a uh, random Elaine uh, said it's a shouldn't we be able to generate embeddings for each of the different type of data possibly using different methods and it's still using the same approach so that that is a kind of similar question uh okay so different types of data um i'm not sure if i understand correct but i can clarify a little bit more uh <clears throat> in my context Uh, no, no, here, let's see. Yeah, here we assume the data is in this form. Uh, okay, so for example, ID one means, uh, for example, the user ID. ID two is the uh, item ID. Yeah, ID three could be the gender ID for this user. And uh, 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 for like ID four could be the uh, ID of the cell phone used by this user and uh, yeah and the id5 could be the uh, category id for the item something like that i mean that's what i'm seeing uh, different ids different type of data yeah when you say type of data i'm not sure you are talking about like video or audio or something else yeah but here in my context the id means data like this Okay. Maybe, yeah, probably you can clarify a bit more uh, question. I can probably give a more accurate. Yeah, we can, we can leave that uh, discussion at the end. So uh, I, think, I don't want to interrupt you too much. Let's continue. <laughs> okay, sure, no problem. Okay, so this is a general training protocol. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a placement. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so we know we have two. Uh, portions for parameters in deep uh, recounter models. And uh, we showed the general training protocol. And uh, okay, then how to do this, how to implement it efficiently. So that is the question, right? So first let's consider the most uh, naive yeah, implementation. Okay, the naive can is very straightforward, right? We just, uh, yeah, fetch the embeddings, yeah, from the CPU machines to collect the long vector. Okay. Yeah, throw it into the deep learning network. Yeah, for forward computation, backward computation, and then synchronize the neural network among multiple GPUs. Okay. Yeah, followed by push back the embedding gradient over here to the CPU machines to update the uh, embedding parameter. Okay, so this is a straightforward implementation. Yeah, for sure, it will not be fast. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> why it's not fast? Yeah, we can think to take, simply uh, take a look at the, the, the running time and charge. Actually, yeah, it's a sequential implementation, it's a sequential run uh, implementation. Okay. Yeah, we probably can do some little bit more optimization by hide the synchronization partially with the computation, the backward computation. Okay, but even we do so, there's no much gain. Yeah. The advantage is this, yeah, this, this naive implementation we call the synchronized updating. Okay, this is the most straightforward and uh, <clears throat> simple implementation. Yeah, simple doesn't mean really simple in the implementation, it means just the, the idea is simple, yeah. Okay, and the <clears throat> positive side is this kind of procedure. Yeah, there's a synchronized uh, updating uh, guarantee good accuracy, but uh, the efficiency, the running time is, uh, is not good, okay, because uh, synchronization, okay. Actually, many uh, existing uh, train engines yeah, use this idea, yeah, use this uh, uh, running time <clears throat> design, 
like uh, XDO by uh, uh, Alibaba, yeah, like the Pido, <coughs> yeah, by Pido. Okay. Okay, if you want to optimize the running time, the idea is uh, in the extreme case, yeah, we fully utilize the GPU's computation power. Okay, it means we should hide the yeah, feature collection, the gradient pathing, and the synchronization by computation. Okay, so in this extreme case, it turns to the asynchronous ability. So this is the ideal case in runtime because the GPU, the most expensive, uh, the most expensive uh, uh, component in the whole yeah hardware in the whole hardware is GPU, right? So we should utilize the GPU, uh, the computation power. This is the ideal case. That's the ideal runtime. Okay, uh, so actually. Uh, like uh, uh, some existing train engines, yeah, use this approach, like XDO's uh, asynchronous updating, okay, and uh, even view, yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this idea, the positive side is uh, it's very efficient in generation. The downside is uh, the accuracy is uh, no, yeah, because of <clears throat> the delayed information, the delayed uh, values is used for updating the model. Yeah, so out of date uh, data, will, <coughs> out of date, the out of date information will uh, could uh, seriously hurt the accuracy. So that is a downside for this idea. Okay, so the question for us, and the <coughs> we are thinking is can we design an algorithm or system to make a better trade-off between Efficiency and uh, accuracy. Okay. Yeah, actually, yes. <clears throat> this is from the key observation. Yeah, the key observation is uh, we find uh, if we use out of date information to update the new network parameter, yeah, the performance will get significantly dropped. Yeah, but if we use uh, the out of date uh, updating for the embedding parameter, it's okay. The main reason is for the embedding parameters, no matter we read it, we write it, it's just a sparse access, this big chunk of matrix. So it means uh, logically we use, yeah, use the out of data information to update out of date gradient update the uh, embedding but in fact that out of date information is not really out of date so that is a key observation over here so based on this observation we are thinking okay why don't we use synchronous update for the new network parameter but use an asynchronous update for embedding parameter so take the benefit from both Synchronization, the uh, synchro and asynchronization. Okay. So it comes to our solution. Yeah, we still hide the feature collection and uh, mm, <clears throat> and the the the, the uh, embedding gradient pathing. Okay, by the computation and the communication. Okay, because this overlapping only cause async update for uh, embedding parameters. Okay. <clears throat> But we use synchronous updating for new network part. Okay, so that is the first step. Okay, and in the meantime, we found okay, we can even do better if we yeah do some implementation optimization. We can yeah partially overlap the computation and the, the synchronization. Okay without hurting the synchronous update for the neural network part. Okay, so this is the, yeah, <clears throat> the last column is a, uh, uh, improved version of optimization. Okay, so we can see if we compare the uh, optimized, uh, yeah, compare this one, 
uh, with the ideal case, we can see the only diff, the only additional loss is kind of minor. Okay, it's kind of minor. So it means- Could you please, we, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, could you please clarify the point about why was it okay for uh, embedding gradients to, uh, to do this way and still not be, uh, not have loss of accuracy? I missed the point. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, would you mind? Uh, you, you said, you know, even though yeah. we are using asynchronous update for embedding, it mm -hmm. is okay because it is not out of sync. So that point about why it is not out of sync was not clear. Oh, I see. So why the asynchronous update for the embedding parameter is uh, not a big deal. It's okay, right? Is that a question? Yeah. Okay, yes. yeah. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, Come back to probably over here. Okay. So the reason is for each sample, okay, each training sample, every time they only fetch one column from one feature. Okay. And when the update, yeah, yeah, when when the <clears throat> when push back the gradient, it also only updates, uh, yeah the corresponding vector over here, the remaining part is unchanging. So it means uh, you have multiple it's very spread right? doing the same thing. Yeah, there is yeah. no, the overlap is quite, uh, yeah, percentage is quite low. So it's, uh, the influence is quite, uh, yeah, minor. So that is a fundamental reason. Okay. Okay. It, it will be very nice to compare in later in your talk versus how Cerebras does weight combining using key value and uh, what you are doing here, but let's continue and we can come back. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so by this design, actually, we yeah, almost achieve the optimum runtime design, okay? Then you may ask, okay, how the accuracy, how the performance, okay? And does it hurt too much? Okay, I will give the answer from two perspectives. Number one is from the theoretic perspective. Yeah, we will theoretically show yeah, that influence is minor. And uh, from the experiment perspective, the second perspective, uh, we will show uh, yeah, empirically it's uh, even you cannot see the diff, okay. So let's look at the theory first, okay. If we use a fine mathematical formulation to formulate the updating rule uh, <clears throat> implied by the hybrid updating, yeah. Mm, async and um, async, okay. And you can write in this way. Yeah, uh, the embedding parameters is the update for in this room. Yes, yeah, basically nothing but the yeah, gradient descent, uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, of course, you can use some other advanced algorithm, the diameter. Yeah, here just using the uh, gradient descent for the baseline algorithm to consider for simplify the uh, statement. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because the embedding part using some stale information. So that's why embedding parameters over here is not using the T steps parameter, is using some early step of embedding parameter, yeah. But uh, because we always use the update uh, uh, value of the new network part, so here it's still T, okay? Uh, the same for the new network part, using the stale information of embedding and the up up-to-date information for new network part, okay? So this is a mathematical formulation <coughs> on the, uh, implied by a, the hybrid updating rule. Okay, so given GT this is a delay, uh, delay function. And then we don't have to worry about delay function. We only need a, a upper bound between DT and T. Yeah, it could be arbitrary. Yeah, okay. as long as it's not too still. Okay, yeah, it's, <laughs> then it's fine. Actually, here this prime the tau exactly what you're asking, okay? This is the upper bound between T and the DT. 
So it means you can, yeah, uh, at most it's update, it is out of date for tall steps. That is, yeah, that is the key to do the analysis. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The value of tau in general, it's just a proportion of number of GPUs, yeah, in the system. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, the convergence result is given over here. The first two items is the rate of just a standard or purely synchronous algorithm. So this is a baseline in terms of performance, and the so last term is the additional part because of using the asynchronous the, because the asynchronous the, uh, updating. Okay, this part, yeah, T is the number of total iterations, yeah, total number of samples you can think. And uh, tau, as I mentioned, is uh, given considered number of GPUs. And the phi over here, yeah, phi over here is the ID's maximum frequency. Yeah, this value is much smaller than one in general. Yeah, let me explain a bit more. So for example, you have one, see, one billion training samples, okay? And uh, uh, for user ID, for example, uh, the user, uh, the user ID, each user ID uh, appears in the, all the samples at most, uh, for example, one one percent, yeah, that's actually pretty large. Yeah, that percentage is pretty large. Yeah, but in general, the percentage is very very low. It's much smaller than one. So such that this item is very small. So if we use okay to make it more clear, if we use the pure uh, async updating, okay? And this item phi will be equal to, yeah, will be, will be equal to one, <clears throat> is that the case? Okay. So let's see how we see the advantage of using the hybrid system. Yeah, this factor is the key. So from, the, <clears throat> okay, in summary, from the, uh, theoretical analysis, we can see uh, the async and the uh, I think uh, hybrid uh, updating actually make a good balance between efficiency and uh, uh, accuracy. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so yeah, I probably can introduce some other system optimizations. Uh, yeah, I have showed a brief ideas how to design the training system, how to design the training engine. Uh, well, of course, uh, the details uh, are the evil as well, and we have a lot of detail, <coughs> yeah, opt optimizations. For example, we uh, designed a, a communication toolkit, uh, yeah, uh, to replace the uh, gRPC, yeah, which we call we call the Persia RPC, yeah, which is ten times faster than gRPC, and uh, we designed. Uh, yeah, using some other one. Yeah, our developer the uh, communication uh, communication uh, framework Bagua. Yeah, to accelerate the communication between GPUs to synchronize parameters. Yeah, and we also designed some compact uh, sample batch representation structure to compress the data. Uh, yeah, the raw data <clears throat> to yeah reduce the communication cost between GPU and the CPU. Yeah, a bunch of other things. Yeah, also use like a, a PyTorch to mix precision to reduce the uh, communication cost between CPU and uh, bit, uh, GPU and uh, use uh, CPU, yeah, CMID instruction. Yeah, a bunch of things. Yeah, anyway, many uh, implementing details. Yeah, I skipped the name over here. So let's come to the empirical study. In the first part, I'm going to show the comparison between synchronous updating, asynchronous updating, and hyper updating to validate uh, uh, our early claim. Okay. <clears throat> but recall, our early claim is hybrid uh, uh, updating is 
in terms of perf in, in terms of accuracy, it's consistent with synchronous uh, updating. In terms of efficiency, it's uh, consistent with async. Okay, so we'll see. The first, <clears throat> we use the pu two public data sets yeah, for file comparison. Mm. And see the left uh, figure uh, is IUC versus the uh, running time. And then we can see the hybrid, I mean the hybrid updating is, uh, yeah, achieve the same, you know, consistent efficiency as the asynchronous one, okay? And the right figure shows the AUC versus the number of steps, okay, number of iterations. Yeah, we can see the accuracy of the hybrid updating is consistent with the synchronous one, okay? So this one basically shows, uh, but it's better than asynchronous one, okay? So this comparison is basically show the efficiency, uh, yeah, per se is kind of a very good trade-off between synchronous updating and asynchronous updating. Okay. And this is a comparison to other public frameworks, yeah, including XDL and by Alibaba and uh, Pido by Baidu, okay? And we can see the uh, significant uh, uh, <clears throat> advantage in terms of efficiency. Yeah, the last uh, you know, study is the scalability. Okay, the scalability refers to two aspects. One is uh, the efficiency over number of workers. Number of workers means number of GPUs and the number of parameters also. Okay, mm. so the left figure basically shows we increase the number of GPUs and uh, the y-axis is the uh, number of samples per second to train. Okay, so we can see the near linear CPU dub is achieved. Okay, <clears throat> the second one actually is showing the uh, in terms of number of parameters, we increase the number of parameters from six to 100 trillions. Okay, and the number of per second training samples basically you can see pretty much the same. Yeah, it means you, yeah, when we enlarge the, uh, the model size, it doesn't uh, influence yeah, our per se is very robust to the training efficiency. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so conclusion over here is uh, in terms of scalability, uh, per se is linearly linear speed up, yeah, yeah with, with respect to number of GPUs and the linear speed up with number of parameters. So the scalability property is uh, well established. Okay, so this is summary, and it was the last page uh, for Persia. Actually, Persia is a uh, heterogeneous architecture yeah, for the consideration of different properties of uh, neural network, uh, the neural network of parameter and uh, uh, embedding parameter. We use a, a hybrid updating rule, yeah, to make a better balance between efficiency and accuracy. And it's also resource efficient because the number of CPU machines could be different from the number of GPU machines. Okay, uh, so you can, yeah, based on your particular uh, need, you can uh, actually change the number of GPUs and the CPUs. Okay. And it's also uh, very flexible. Yeah, you can even throw everything into a single machine. Yeah. <clears throat> and the model size we achieved is about, uh, yeah, it's reached the 100 trillion parameters. It's a new yeah, uh, record for the recombinant models in the public record, <clears throat> in the public the train engines. Yeah. So this framework has been public in GitHub, and uh, it was also invited to integrate the PyTorch Lightning. Okay, so this is a paper link over here, and this is a GitHub link over here. Yeah, this is a bagua we used uh, 
uh, in Persia, yeah, which is a disputed uh, training uh, framework. <clears throat> yeah, where I introduced last time. Yeah. Okay, this pretty much ends uh, my presentation. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for uh, for this, this fascinating talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Just talk. We only have a few people. Okay. Well, people silence. Uh, let me ask them my first uh, first question. Can you share the slides afterwards? Yes. Okay. And uh, what about recording? Can we publish the recording? Yes. Okay. Cool. Great. So I'll I'll post the post links so once I got the slides link and uh, and uh, recording I'll share, put on the you know meetup page. Anyone has questions regarding this topic? This is kind of fascinating. I I know this. Uh, uh, some people felt that it was a pretty deep, really deep. But this is probably the state of the art work. So anybody has questions on this? People silence. <laughs> so the, the uh, let Sorry me ask about that. Yeah, that's uh, it's uh, yeah probably too much uh, technical details. <laughs> yeah, for next, I can give a high level presentation. Yeah, high level. Uh, yeah, for for the recommendation systems. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the I noticed on the, when you do the experimentation, some are on the mm -hmm. uh, the uh, some are experimentation on the cloud on the Google Cloud is one of them, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because to run the uh, the, the, the experiment on um, one hundred uh, training uh, prime to model, mm -hmm. yeah, we contact the Google Cloud and they uh, send some people to assist us. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> to a very special assistant. Yeah, <laughs> assistant for, for to us to support the, to make sure it's runnable. Yeah, we coordinator for multiple iterations and uh, finally we can run it on google cloud <laughs> yeah google cloud yeah totally they 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 they, they, they are also very happy yeah they, they are also very happy with this experiment they are yeah going to announce uh, some news about this in their own <coughs> yeah news feed yeah so uh, the other question is that uh, so the, the, this is a lot of uh, you know both engineering work and academic work so uh, is this a system or currently in production on the Quaiso? Yes, yeah, yeah. This one uh, actually supports, uh, um, has been, yeah, this, actually this engine has been uh, validated in several core products like uh, ads, like uh, a recommendation system for uh, <coughs> Quaiso's uh, uh, abroad uh, app, yeah. Yes, and there's a maximum um DAU the the the, the maximum um DAU to, uh, is uh, I think it's reached almost uh, one I think it's almost one one hundred uh, million yeah in in some <coughs> in some app yeah the DAU is about uh near is close to one hundred million so basically that, 100 100 million uh, daily yeah, users. Yeah, yeah, use, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that training data is very, uh, training sample is very huge. Yeah, it's very, very huge. Yeah. Yeah, this is excellent. And uh, this is the excellent, you know, excellent talk and excellent work. So yeah, yeah thank yeah. you so much. So uh, yeah. Yeah, for that part, it's, yeah, for that part, it's the property the uh, sensitive. Yeah, <laughs> I, I cannot go too much. Yeah, so this <laughs> one is purely from the technical view perspective, yeah. Mm. Understand, understand. Yeah. Actually, the problem is this is one of the earliest uh, GPU training engines. Yeah, uh, we started on, we started this project uh, in 2000, yeah, 2018. Yeah, at that stage and uh, the um, common um, sense for uh, people in recommendation, recommender system is still uh, using the pure GPU machines, yeah. And that's uh, common sense and uh, 
um, almost all the companies in China still use this one. Yeah. Uh, also, most of, yeah, I think also almost all the companies, yeah, um, in the United States. Yeah. Because at that stage, I visited Facebook and um, yeah, they told me they are still using the CPU. I, yeah. I had a very simple question. Yeah. Uh, that when you carried out your evaluation that you share in the end, uh, was there any graph data type? And how did you treat that during the embedding? Uh, could you comment just briefly on any special care you had to take to implement your method on graph data? Graph data? Um, graph, yeah. Uh, can you be more specific? Which figure are you uh, talking about or? Graph neural network. Did you have any graph neural network? In the... uh, uh -huh. yeah. We okay. We didn't. Uh, uh, I didn't show graph the work uh, data over here, but uh, we do it uh, kind of in offline. Yes, it's kind of similar because the graph, uh, the, the graph computing. If you take a look at the mathematic formulation, is pretty much very very similar to the recombination model. So yeah, the performance is kind of similar. Um, yeah, basically okay. you have similar observations. Yeah, over here, over here. If you view, yeah, if you look at, yeah, if you view uh, the um, embeddings for each load as the uh, embedding primers over here, and uh, the neural network part in graph embedding, the same as neural part in the recombinant models, and everything mm -hmm. should be the same. Yeah. You use just uh, localized convolution in the graph or uh, have higher degree Chebyshev polynomial or could you could you comment how deeply you were going to the neighbors, just nearest neighbors or too deep neighbors during the embeddings? Oh, okay, good question. Yeah. For that part, we can actually do it on offline. Ready. Okay. So make sure everything the inputs is exactly the same as the turning data in recommendation <laughs> system. Yeah. Okay. So in that sense, yes. Mm. So offline. Yeah, if you we want to do the online parts in the graph, that's another story. That's uh, that that needs some additional implementation, additional work to do the online parsing. Yeah, it's, as you said, the 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 the. the uh, one degree neighbor, two degree neighbor, my height would be that, that, that part actually uh, do yeah, that one, that part is additional part to do the, uh, if we want to uh, do the graph computing training, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. Okay. okay, last chance, last questions. Uh, I, I know we're kind of over 10, 30 minutes over, but uh, you know, this is uh, your, if you have any questions, last chance. All right, if no more questions, 